not saying keep looking at me. What he is actually talking about is broader than keep looking at me. What he means is that the promise that God made in the Old Testament has come to pass. I am with you. I am with you. The word ego imai. I am with you. That's the same word for Yahweh. Yahweh. I am that I am and I will be what I will be. I am that I am and I will be what I will be. In other words, when he said, lo, I am with you, it means I have brought that promise to pass. I have brought that promise to pass. Look at it. So where do I look at it? Look at it low. Look at it intently. So where do I look at it? Number one, I look at it in the Old Testament text. I look at it in the Old Testament text. That what God has promised, he has done. I look at it at the Old Testament text. That what God has promised, he has also done. Number two, that what he has, what, he, what has he promised to do? What God promised in Genesis, which now found expression in Exodus, was to dwell with us. To dwell with us. And to dwell with us will mean to dwell in us. To dwell with us will mean to dwell in us. The Genesis promise of an exodus was that God will dwell among us. So when he says, lo, I am with you, which means in our study of scripture, we must see that ever abiding presence of Yahweh. That ever abiding presence of Yahweh. Or the ever abiding presence of God with us. Now we have explored and if you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse number 4. Hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God is one Lord. Which we said is the message. The Lord our God is one Lord. That is the message. So when he says, Lo, I am with you, the word I am is the background of the name Yahweh. I am that I am. I will be what I will be. You will find that in Exodus 3.14, what God told Moses. And in Exodus chapter 6, verse number 2. Exodus 3.14 and Exodus chapter 6 verse number 2. <clears throat> so let's look at Deuteronomy again. Chapter 6 verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse number 4. Please pay attention. Hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Shema Israel Yahweh Elohino Ekat Yahweh. That's the Hebrew. This is the message, O Israel, that the one who will be what he will be. This is the message, O Israel, that the one who will be what he will be, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, he is light. The one who will be what he will be, according to Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, he is light that separates from darkness. He is light that separates from darkness. He is the seed in Genesis 1.11. He is the seed in Genesis 1.11. He is that man in the likeness and image of God. He is that man in the likeness and image of God. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 28. 
He is the light. The I am that I am. I will be what I will be. He is the light out of darkness in Genesis 1.3. He is the seed in Genesis 1.11. He is the image and the likeness of God in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 28. He is the seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. The I am that I am, I will be what I will be. Genesis 3 15. He is the seed of the woman that will bruise the head of the serpent. He is the seed of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 verse 5 to 7. He is the seed of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15 verse 5 to 7. So if he is the I am. Then he is the lamb that was slain. In Genesis 22 verse 8. He is the lamb of God that was slain. In Genesis chapter 22 verse number 8. He is the only begotten, the only begotten in Genesis chapter 22 verse 2. He is the only begotten. I am, says the Lord your God. He is the same or he is together. The word Ikad. He is the same or he is together. Ikad. Are you following? Hello, are you following? You can't be lost. We have prayed the efficient prayer. <laughs> you don't want to say we should pray the efficient prayer. So we are wondering what are we praying for? That you understand it. You need revelation knowledge to understand because what we are doing here is not, it's not brain work. It's revelation knowledge. So we said that statement in Deuteronomy 6.4. Is the mission of Israel or the mission of the church. The redemptive work of Christ. Which is the I am that I am. I will be what I will be. The name Yahweh. The redemptive work of Christ. The sanctifying work of Christ in all the nations. The delivering work of Christ in all the nations. And the abiding work of Christ in all the nations. The redemptive work of Christ. The sanctifying work of Christ in all the nations. That is the mission that Israel was supposed to announce to the world. Which is now the mission of the church. To talk about the delivering work of Christ in all the nations. To talk about the abiding work of Christ in all the nations. So we can safely say that Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 is the gospel in that simple sentence. Is the gospel in that simple sentence. The Lord your God. The Lord is the savior. The Lord is the sanctifier. The Lord is the kinsman redeemer. The Lord is also one to worship. The Lord, he is the one and the same. This is the background for the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, the Savior. So we said, you can't claim to know God and not know Jesus. You can't claim to know God and not know Jesus. You don't know Jesus. And then try to fit him in God. You don't know Jesus. And then you try to fit him in God. You know Jesus. And then that is how you figure out who God is. By knowing Jesus. That is how you figure out who God is. So that is the mission. And I mentioned that oftentimes we abuse scriptures in the body of Christ. And I'm talking about the body of Christ generally. You know, for example, if you use a biology textbook, 
a biology textbook for agriculture. Because the biology textbook used an agricultural term for an illustration. You are not smart. You are using a biology book. And then in the course of reading the biology book, you saw an illustration where an agricultural term was used. Then you now say, this must be agricultural textbook. You are not smart. Is that true? If you use mathematics textbook that uses soccer illustrations, and then you say you want to learn soccer from mathematics textbook, you are not smart. Is that true? You are a dummy. An illustration is not the message. An illustration is not the message. It is a signpost to the message. It is a signpost to the message. So we said the Old Testament particularly is filled with illustrations. The Old Testament particularly is filled with illustrations. We have physical, natural illustrations are used to point out spiritual realities. We have physical, natural illustrations are used to point out spiritual realities. Please pay attention. Just like the seed, the light, a lot more. So let's take a short journey. A journey to Mount Moriah. Where Abraham, whom God spoke to, that it is through him and his seed that all nations of the earth will be blessed. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 to 3. You can write that down. And Genesis chapter 15 verse 4 to 6. Genesis 12 1 to 3. Genesis 15 from verse 4 to 6. So Abraham goes to Mount Moriah. Pay close attention. And if you are sleeping, please sleep deeply now. So that you will not hear what I am not saying. He takes his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. Oftentimes people have twisted that narrative and said. God wanted to know whether Abraham will obey him. And whether he will kill his son. So as he was about to do it. God says stop. Now I know you love me. Or now I know you will obey me. Someone said, so Abraham challenged God. You do this for me and I will give my son. That's good, but that's not smart. If you read the whole account, turn to your neighbor and say, read the whole account. Tell your neighbor, always read the whole account. You will discover that in Genesis chapter 22, what you find in verse 2 is take now your son Isaac. Specify. The reason for the specification was because there was an Ishmael. Your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. The truth here is what I'm about to say. Whom you love means whom you prefer. Now the honest truth is, if you read the whole account, God's preference is Isaac. So when he says your only son, the moment you know there's Ishmael in the background, you know that there's a message that is about to be passed across. I don't know if you understand. It's like, it's like, it's like, I'm trying to talk to you and your two children are there. And I say, take your only son. Your only son. Eh? I'm trying to tell the father a message that only the father will understand. Because the father doesn't have an only son. 
there are two sons and the sons are there. So I'm using a coded language to tell the father what I want to tell him. So take your son, your only son, whom you love. The only son is not Isaac. But God is passing a message across. Why? Ishmael is born of a bond woman. Isaac is born by a free woman, which is Sarah. Take your son from freedom. Take your son from the miraculous or take your son from the power of God, which is why he uses the word only. Only. Now, when you get to the New Testament, he now uses his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Because Isaac is the only son whom Abraham loves. Why? Because it was an illustration from which a spiritual reality was being communicated. Now, when the New Testament will report it, it didn't talk about the illustration because we don't need the illustration anymore. The reality is here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Where did he get the verbiage, only begotten son? From Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. Why was it used as an illustration? Because it was a message pointing to a future reality. I'm teaching good? Stay with me. So, illustrations are not the message. But illustrations are pointers to the message. When you get to that New Testament, when he uses the word only begotten, is the word unique. The Greek word monogenes. Mono genes mono as in m o n o mono genes g e n e s take that unique song what's unique about isaac is not his height is not his hairstyle what's unique about isaac is not that he's a male what's unique about isaac is the way he is born the way he is born is different from the way others are born. Isaac therefore stands in that illustration of the work of Christ. And Abraham knew it. Abraham knew it. Because the language only son is a spiritual terminology. And Abraham understood it. That there is a promise of a seed. And that promise is what God is talking about. So on their way, look at Genesis 22 verse 7. Genesis chapter 22 verse number 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. And he said, behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Why is Isaac asking for a lamb? Because when he was sending the servant, he said, I and the young lad shall go yonder to worship and we shall come back. And Isaac had worship. Isaac had that we are going to worship. And understanding the culture, when you're going to worship a deity, you must of necessity come with a sacrifice. That was the cultural practice in their time. Are you following? So in verse 8, when Isaac asked, where is the offering? Now in their culture, like I told you, you know, God will work with man's understanding. God will do what? God will walk with man's understanding. In the oriental times where Abraham grew up, if I am going to talk to you, to communicate with you, I must learn your language. The only way I can communicate with you 
is by learning your language. Imagine if I didn't know how to speak English. All this revelation knowledge that I carry, I won't be able to communicate except I learn the language. And that is why I have discovered the supernatural grace of God even if a man is not educated and he begins to study the word of God, it affects his intelligence. How many of you have understood that? Suddenly your grammar begins to develop. Suddenly your communication skills begin to come to the fore. Before you know it, an illiterate is speaking as if he's a professor. What happens is because the spirit of God is the spirit of intelligence. God is a God of knowledge. God does, not, God does not tolerate ignorance at all. Zero, God has zero tolerance for ignorance. So within the capacity of his spirit, there's an enablement for developing intelligence. That's why some people who listen to me teach tell me that I did not know how to speak English. But as I was listening to you teach, suddenly I began to understand. And then I began to find out that I could say some things you are saying. And now eventually I speak English. I've come across a number of people like that. Because that's what the word of God does. So if God is going to communicate with man. He will have to use man's language. God will have to use man's language. So God uses man's language. Listen carefully everybody. What we call the word of God is in human language. What we call the word of God is in human language. That's important. So in Abraham's day, they offered sacrifices to their deities. The deities in worship require sacrifices. That is in their culture. How many of you know that even in our day today, native doctors require sacrifices? How many of you know that? If you are going to go to a native doctor, you must go to a native doctor expecting to offer. Sometimes you take red fowl. They don't call it chicken in native doctor's house. They call it fowl because they operate with foul spirits. Bring white fowl. Bring red fowl. Bring fowl without head. Strange things. Bring chameleon without legs. Bring rat white color. They ask for impossible things. Then you see somebody carry red fowl in the night. Where is he going? He is going to worship. <laughs> He's going before a deity. It's culture. Are we in the building? So that is how it was in the days of Abraham. And remember they came from a culture of idol worship. So Isaac was already used to it because they have been going. He grew up to see his father offering to idols. So now they are going again to worship. So Isaac is asking, where is the animal? But what is Yahweh saying? In their culture, the heir is the first son. Or what we call the firstborn. And the firstborn has rights. The first thing is, it's not Ishmael, but Isaac. So the first thing is, there's a counter-narrative. There's a counter-narrative used by God. Not Ishmael, Isaac, firstborn. What they know is that you present an offering to a deity. What God is about to teach Isaac through Abraham. And so Isaac, who knows the culture, says, if we are going to worship Elohim or Eloha, God, that question Isaac asked was like a question in a Bible study. Where is the lamb? It's like we're having a Bible study. And I say, well, in this teaching that I'm teaching, let's go to worship. 
Let's go and offer because I'm teaching you something. So as we are going, the question you will ask me in that Bible study is, where is the animal? If we are going to worship a deity. It's the same question Isaac was asking Abraham because Abraham and Isaac were doing a Bible study using an illustration of going to worship. I'm teaching good? Now, so, the use of a lamb for a deity did not come from God. The use of a lamb for a deity did not come from God. It came from human culture. It came from human culture. So here they are with the element of sacrifice. And he says, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said in verse 8, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. What is that? That shows you that God does not take. God gives. Counter narrative. God does not take. God gives. That is a counter -narr narrative to the idols they were worshipping. In idol worship, man offers to the idols. But in the worship of God, God offers himself. Counter. So there are two counter narratives. Have we seen two counter narratives? What's the first counter narrative? Eh? First counter narrative we saw. Your firstborn. Not Ishmael. But Isaac, counter. What is the second one? God does not take, God gives. But in idol worship, the idols take. The idols take. Alright? Please stay with me because it's very, very fundamental to the understanding of how to love God on his own terms. God will provide. The word provide here. You know, we always use the word Jehovah Jireh. My provider, the Lord is sufficient for me, for me, for me. It's true. But let's find out what it means in this context. The word God will provide is the word Ra. R-A-A-H. The word Ra. In the Hebrew, Ra. You know, we said that the background of Genesis 12 is Genesis chapter 1 to 11. So what the word Ra means is to see ahead of time what is going to happen. Ra. To see ahead of time what is going to happen. To see a provision. To see a situation ahead. It's a word that is used for providence. To see ahead what has been provided. Now let's backtrack a bit. If we're all on the same page, can I have a powerful amen? amen? Let's backtrack a bit. Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. God saw the light. God saw the light that it was good. God saw. God saw the light. God is making a provision. Remember, the problem in verse 2 is darkness. So God is making a provision of light because of the problem of darkness. And what he made provision for was good. What God provided was good. We have said Genesis 1 is not a book of science. Genesis 1 is a book of salvation. To solve the problem of man's darkness. To solve the problem of man's darkness. So God provides the light. He said, me be. I am the light. Me be. God said, light be. Be me. Am me. Be. Are you following? 
I am the light. So God makes a provision to be light to solve man's problem of darkness. Why? I am that I am. I will be what I will be. So if I have to be light to solve man's darkness, I am. And within the I am is the ability to be what I will be. Me be. Light be. Why light? To solve the problem of Genesis chapter 1 verse number 2. So God makes a provision to be light. To solve man's problem of darkness. So when he said... And then he saw it, it was good. Which means God provided for it. God has provided for light where there was darkness. You will see the same thing in verse 10 of Genesis chapter 1. Put it up for me. Genesis chapter 1 verse 10. Are you still here? Genesis chapter 1 verse 10. And God called, and God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Take note of the word God saw that it was good. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 of Genesis 1. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good verse 18 of genesis 1 and to rule over the day and over the night to divide the light from the darkness and god saw that it was good verse 21 verse 21 verse 21 and God created great whales and every living creature that move it, that move it, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and ever winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was what? Good. Pay attention. Verse 31. Pay attention. Verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good and the evening and the morning were the sixth day now when you have the word gospel pay attention when you have the word gospel which is the word good news good news the, the word in the Greek, euagelion. Euagelion. E-U-A-G-E-L-L-I-O-N. Euagelion. A message that is good. What is it? It is God's provision of Jesus for our sins. God's provision of Jesus for our sins. This is the background of the word gospel. Pool. Gospel. What God has provided light to shine in the darkness. Gospel. <laughs> Glory to God. Gospel. What God has provided light to shine out of darkness. So this is not a creation story. Genesis is a creation parable to communicate the new creation. A creation parable to communicate the new creation. So, it is a redemption story with the parable of creation. Oh boy. A redemption story with the parable of a new creation or the parable of creation. The next thing you will see in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, please pay attention. Genesis chapter 2 verse number 18. 
And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. He brought them for Adam to see. God saw. Abraham saw. Adam to see. Verse 24. Genesis 2.24. Pay attention. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now look at Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. Genesis chapter 6 verse number 5. Pay attention. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Look at verse 12 of Genesis 6. Genesis 6, 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. So when you hear God saw, make a mental note of what I am about to say. God saw. Make a mental note now. It is God causing his prophets to see a provision. When we say God saw, it is God causing his prophets to see a provision. Moses wrote down God's provision for salvation. Moses wrote down God's provision for salvation. In Genesis 1-2, Genesis 1 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Hmm. In Genesis 6, are you following? In Genesis 1 2, it was Moses who saw through the eyes of God God's provision for salvation. Did you make that mental note? Now in Genesis chapter 6, it is Noah who is made to see. Noah. So, Noah becomes that preacher of righteousness. Genesis 6, 3. Noah, a preacher of righteousness. So, God caused Noah to see it. So, what we have here is the prophet's office. So, 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 so. That is the prophet's office. Galatians 3, 8. Pay attention. Galatians chapter 3, verse number 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God will justify the hidden through faith preach before the gospel unto Abraham saying, in thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. God, God will justify. The scripture foresee. Are you here? What foresaw? The scripture. Who wrote the scripture? The prophet. So who foresaw? The prophet. So when he said, and God saw, it was Moses through the lens of God that saw God's providence. Now Noah sees God's providence to solve the problem of man's wickedness in Genesis chapter 6. So Genesis 1, the scripture for seeing what God will do. Genesis 6, the scripture for seeing what God will do. What do you mean? Preach the gospel to Abraham. In the Greek, it is preach the gospel through Abraham. 
preach the gospel through Abraham. That's the original Greek. So which means that God is causing men to see his plans. God is causing men to see his purpose. And God is causing men to see his provisions. God is causing men to see his plan, to see his purpose, and to see his provision. Stay with me. Write this down, circle it, and keep it for seller. Acts chapter 2, verse 29 to 34. Acts chapter 2, verse 29 to 34. So, on Mount Moriah, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Genesis 22, verse 8. The word Ra, R-A-A-H. Now go to that Genesis chapter 22 verse 13 and 14. Pay attention. And Abraham lifted up his eyes. Who lifted up his eyes? Abraham. And looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a ticket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Verse 14, please pay attention, I beg you. And Abraham, who? Who? Abraham called the name of that place, who called the name? So it was Abraham that named it, not God. Abraham called the name of that place, Jehovah Jireh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Who shall see it on the mount? God or Abraham? So who saw? Abraham. Because Abraham was a prophet. Genesis 27. Abraham was a prophet. The word Nabi. Abraham was a prophet. So that's why Abraham saw on the mount. So when you say Jehovah Jireh, it means I, Abraham, I saw God do it. I, Abraham, I saw God do it. Abraham saw God do it. He saw God provide the sacrifice. He saw God provide the solution. Abraham saw it. So the concept of Jireh, Jireh is the prophet's office, which Abraham was. Genesis 20 verse 7. Put it up. Genesis 20 verse 7. Now therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. He is a prophet. He is a nabi. The Hebrew word for prophet. N-A-B-I. Nabi. In house it is a nabi. A nabi. Hebrew, nabi. They are close, right? Languages have a way of overlapping. Okay. Now, he is a prophet. He saw God's purpose and provision. Question, what is God doing with the gospel? God is reversing human thinking. God is reversing human thinking. In idolatry, you give a sacrifice to God. In Christianity, God makes the provision for our sins. So when you go to a church where the pastor ties your blessings to your offering, you and your pastor are in idol worship. If you need fruit of the womb, sow an uncommon seed. If you need business breakthrough, sow an unusual seed. If you need promotion in your office, sow a sacrificial seed. Hmm? If you need a wife or a husband, life partner, 
So an an overwhelming seed. If you want your boss to be fired, so a dangerous seed. Both you and that man of God, you people are in idol worship. Because it is only in idol worship you bring to the deity for the deity to answer you. In Christianity, God gave to us. And in giving to us, he brought many sons to glory. If I'm teaching good this morning, shout I hear you. Many churches, many churches are actually a mixture of Christianity and idolatry and African tradition. ATR. The short form for African traditional religion. ATR in capital letters. We said here, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Why did he say that? Because they were also in a society of idolatry. In other words, this is a counter narrative. The Lord your God is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the one that will make the provision by himself. He does not require anything from your hands. You don't give anything to be saved. You don't mobilize him to do anything for you. He's not a Nigerian contractor that requires mobilization to move boys to sight. He is self-mobilized. Glory to God. The Lord your God makes the provision. He makes the light in darkness. He is the seed in the earth. He is the image of God in man. He is all by himself sufficient for us. And Abraham saw that. Just like Genesis chapter 4. Where we have seen Cain and Abel. People have assumed that Cain offered vegetable salad. And Abel offered suya mama. And because God eats suya. God received Abel's suya and rejected Cain's salad. <laughs> I told you what happened, right? I've told you what happened. You find out that Abel, the word used for firstling there, is the same word for the firstborn. And the firstborn means one who will carry a responsibility. So Abel offered himself to carry the responsibility of God's blessing in the earth. Cain despised it. So the reason why Cain despised it is because he despised. He didn't see any reason for it. He had no value. He was valueless. And so what did Cain do? He set up the pattern for persecuting the prophets. He became the first to kill a man of God. And you see that. That sets the tone for the persecution of all of God's servants throughout scriptures. Cain was the first antichrist in the Bible. He was the first fruit, the firstborn of antichrist. Abel is God's prophet. Abel is God's servant. The offering there means availability to be used of God. That was the meaning of firstborn, firstling, which, you know, that was what it meant. So the entire story of Genesis are men who carried the promise of God. Men who heralded the gospel in their generation. Men who preached it in their generation as the cure to man's sin and separation from God. In other words, the worship of God stems from a fundamental fact. Take down this. Number one, he is the true God. The fundamental fact for the worship of God. Number one, he is the true God. He's not one of the gods. Number two, he made the heavens and the earth. 
Number three, he is the only savior in all mankind. The only savior in all mankind. Number four, he doesn't require a sacrifice. He doesn't require a sacrifice. Those are key issues that you and I must see. So as a round of this service, and in the second service, we will get into these Ten Commandments very brutally. Are you here? Yeah. Deuteronomy 6.4. When Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Why does he say that? Because when Moses goes to Israel to deliver them in Genesis 3.14, he says, the God of your fathers have sent me. They say, what is his name? He says, I am that I am, Yahweh. In other words, he is saying to them, worship God as your Messiah. Worship God as your Savior. Worship God as your Sanctifier. Hear, O Israel... The Lord your God is one. Now therefore, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. Put it up for me. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse number 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God. After he said, hear O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He now said, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thine soul and with all thy mind. You shall love the Lord your God with all. Which means I esteem him as my savior. I esteem him as my redeemer. I esteem him as my sanctifier. Because in Exodus chapter 6 verse 2 to 7. Exodus chapter 6 verse 2 to 7. God spake unto Moses and said unto him. I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. And I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. Watch this. I have also had the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will read you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with a stretch out arm and with great judgments. Seven. And I will take you to me for a people. I will be to you a God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God which bringeth you out. I'm the one doing everything. I demand nothing from you. I will do everything and bring you out to myself. We saw what God promised to do. And Moses is saying, esteem him above all the idols. In other words, believe him. In other words, believe the gospel. So if you go to Exodus chapter 20, which we call the Ten Commandments, we call what? But if you observe, there are only two. What we call the Ten Commandments, if you observe carefully, there are only two. Exodus chapter 20 verse 1. Pay attention. Mm. And God spake all these words saying... I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out. Which have what? He promised I will bring you out. Now he has brought them out. Which means the promise is fulfilled. Which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Consistently we must see him as our savior. That's the background. We must consistently see God as our savior. Verse 3 of Exodus 20. Are you still in the building? If you're here, shout glory. glory. 
Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Next verse. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. The word jealous there is not jealousy. Jealousy. Jealous there means I am a passionate God. Jealous. Passionate. I'm a passionate God. Watch this. Visiting. This is the mother of generational cause services. And this is the father of ancestral covenant breaking. This verse. This is where they get it from. The original verse before it graduates to other verses. This is the fundamental. This is the root. The Baba for generational causes. Ancestral causes. Family patterns. There is a pattern. All firstborns never succeed. There is a pattern. All the girls never get husband to marry. There is a pattern. Poverty is heavy on the second born. There is a pattern. All first borns are useless. So service of the first borns. All is from this verse. When a scripture is misinterpreted, a truth is lost. I want to close. Should I close? I shouldn't close. I should settle here. Keep on the gaba. Thou shalt not bow thyself to them, nor serve them. Then they will tell you, you know, in Africa, there is no family that does not have idol worship. Every family. If it didn't happen with your grandfathers, it happened with your great-grandfathers, it happened with your great... Everybody in Africa came from a family that has idol worship. Very true. Very true. In Israel too, there were families with idol worship. And Jesus was born in one. And Jesus did not go for covenant breaking. Because he came from a family of Mary and Joseph. And they too were from an ancestry where there was idol worship. Selah. <laughs> For I, the Lord thy God, am a passionate God. Visiting the iniquity. So in the minds of nominal Christians and nominal preachers, visiting is visit. Visit, I will visit you. So, when he says visiting the iniquities of the fathers, it means God will bring all the judgment, the bad, bad things that your fathers did on your head. That's how they interpret it. And it makes sense because in English language, visiting is visit. But in the Bible language, the word visit is the word pakard. Pakard. Pakard means take care of. So what he means is, I am the Lord thy God. I'm a passionate God. I will take care of the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. What he means is, I will take care of it so that the children to the third and fourth generation will not partake of what their fathers did. So that scripture that they use for breaking of causes is the scripture that frees a man from those causes. I don't know if I'm teaching here. For example, when he says, and the Lord visited Sarah as he has said. What he means is, and the Lord took care of Sarah as he has said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. And Sarah said, the Lord has made me laugh. So when God visits, the outcome is laughter. God does not visit to judge. He visits to provide laughter. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. Well, if you're catching my flow, jump on your feet and shout glory. That's a shouting ground. That's a shouting spot. That's a celebration scripture. And the Lord visited to care of Sarah. As he has said. And what was the result of the visit? Sarah said, God has made me to laugh. 
She didn't say, God has made me to attend generational cost services. Breaking of family patterns. No. God took care of. That's the meaning of the word visiting. Per card. It doesn't mean that God brought it to them. God took care of it. That's why their children did not partake of it. The fathers died in the wilderness, but the children entered because God took care. I'm teaching good this morning. That's why Ezekiel will say, no more. Put it in Ezekiel 18, 1 and 2 as we close this house. Glory to Ezekiel 18 verse 1 and 2. Put it up. Can we all read together? Everybody like a mass choir. Everybody stand. That's where I'm rounding up this service. Can we all read like a mass choir? The radio audience and online people want to hear your voices. One, two, go. The word of the Lord came unto me again saying. Next verse. What mean ye that you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel saying the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That is what the fathers did. The children are suffering it. Why are you using such a proverb in Israel? Next verse. Verse 3. Everybody want to go. As I live, saith the Lord God, you shall not have occasion anymore to use this proverb in Israel. It's over. That proverb never existed. And where they use it as a superstition, God said, it shall no more be used. Look at the next verse. Verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sinned. So if your father did something wrong, he will partake of it himself. It shall not affect you. Everything your father did ended with your father. You are a new generation. If any man in Christ is a new creation, all things are passed away. Behold, 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 behold. Glory to God. I'm a new creation, I'm a brand new man. All things are passed away. I'm born again. More than a conqueror. That's who I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Hit it, let's do it. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. All things are passed away. knowledge grows big in this house in our hearts until nothing else matters in the name of Jesus we rejoice in this light we walk in this light we stand fast in this light and we celebrate this light and we communicate this light to our world in the name of Jesus thank you father for answer prayer 
in Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Amen. Glory! Amen. amen. All right. I want to take up your honor offerings, but just before I do that quickly, today is the last day for our commitments to our project, the uh, $235. I mean, $235,000 project for this second phase of the year. And I want to thank all of you who reached out, those of you who supported the project, and those of you who gave towards the project, and those of you who are still giving towards the project. We have not made the target, but I still want to thank all of you who sacrificed and gave towards the project. And those of you who are not part of it, you want to be a part of it, you just need to send me a mail today, drabeldamina at yahoo.com, asking for the banking details. We will email the banking details to you so you can commit your monies towards this project. Remember, people gave for you to hear. If you also give, more people will hear and come to this light. That's why we sacrifice so that the gospel can get to more people. So that what Jesus died for will reach people for whom he died for. And I want to thank those of you who have made sacrifices who are still making sacrifices to help us get these projects carried out effectively for the gospel to get to all men. Can I have a good amen? amen? And then those of you that already got the details, you're redeeming it. You know, make sure you send in all your commitments today. And in the campus, these campus coordinators are also going to help us ensure that all those who want to get, up, get their monies to us are able to do it effectively. Amen. And in this house, at the end of the service, we'll take your own commitments before we close. Grab your honor offerings. Let's give. The banking details are on the screen. All over the all over the different countries. You give your offerings. We give with joy. We give with gladness. We're excited about all that God has done for us. Remember, at 11 a.m. GMT plus one, I'll be live again, continuing to teach. And we're going to zero in on the Ten Commandments very effectively in the second service as part of what we're teaching because we're dealing with how to love God on his own terms. Can I have a good amen? amen? Lift up your honor offerings. Father, we rejoice for the privilege to give. We give in faith, we give with joy, and we thank you for the opportunity to make a difference in our world. Thank you that our offerings are a sweet smell before you today. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. All right, you will come and drop your offerings anywhere on the pulpit. Ushers will direct you on what to do. Hit the music. Let's do it as we worship Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. Hallelujah.
More than enough. Ay, 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 ay. Not enough. More than enough. Hallelujah. Please, let's take a good offering and we give the worship offering for this service and the kingdom investment. We are giving the two offerings at the same time. Please take note that you are giving generously, sacrificially, and we are giving in honor. Leave that offering and give. Let's give thanks to God for the privilege to give. Just say something. Say something. You are not just throwing. You are just giving. You are honoring God. We are giving in reverence to him. We are giving in faith. We are giving in worship. So say something, say something, say something. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the privilege one more time to give. We give again and again to the necessity of the preaching of the gospel. Thank you because you supply all our needs according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We give you praise this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, kingdom investments in the baskets and the offerings. Worship offering, right? Hallelujah. If you know you have the joy of salvation, can I hear you make some noise? Woo! I have a joy, the joy of salvation, the joy of deliverance. The joy of salvation, I have a joy. The joy of salvation, the joy of deliverance, joy every day. I will go, I will go. 
I tell you what a time we're having in the presence of God's word. Amen. Please, you can be seated this morning. And I'm sure the online people are being signed off now. We look forward to seeing all of you at 11 a.m. GMT plus one. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. We trust that you have been blessed by this message. To order the complete series of this message and all the messages by Dr. Abel Daminer, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com.